Michael Nam is a biologist and parapsychologist whose psi research has focused on phenomena such as terminal lucidity, near-death experiences, cases of the reincarnation type, and other riddles of consciousness and evolution. Michael first coined the term terminal lucidity in 2009 in an article for the Journal of Near-Death Studies. He's written multiple books and has published a plethora of articles and scientific papers. Scroll into the description for timestamps, extra info, and useful links. And if you enjoy this video, please like, comment, and share. Thank you. Thank you for doing this with me, Michael. Um, to start us off, can you please tell me a little bit about your background and about your main areas of study and research interest? Yeah, thanks for the invitation to be here. My pleasure. And I always consider myself to be a biologist. I still do, even mm -hmm. though I am not strictly working in the field of what people typically would understand to be biology, but yeah. I am by training and have always been fascinated by biological topics. Mm -hmm. And and in a general sense, I think that biology is also much more than what is typically taught in biology lessons and also in my studies at university, because mm -hmm. biology is, as I see it, it's the study of life. And life also includes mind, consciousness, and these kind of weirder things that you yeah. typically don't um, address in these classical biological lessons. And I was very uh, happy to have a teacher in my high school in mm -hmm. biology, and he already instructed us or recommended us to also have a look at kind of unsolved riddles and open questions of biology. He introduced us into philosophical questions, telling us about Schopenhauer and Kant, and, and that maybe there's a reality behind the screen of perception that we perceive with our biological senses to construct a world from that, that may be very different from that what we perceive. And yeah. so I kind of pursued these recommendations. And this is what always interested me most. So kind of these open questions. And when you really pursue those questions, you enter the realm of psychology and psychological problems. And if you study unsolved and open questions of psychology, you end up studying parapsychology. So one step leads to the next. And even though I'm still concerned with studying life, I am not so much uh, doing classical biology, but rather parapsychology. And this is what I'm doing at the IGPP, the Institute for Frontier Areas of Psychology in Freiburg since a couple of days, uh, years now. <laughs> Time flies. Yes, yeah. absolutely. <laughs> since no, a that's... couple of seconds. Yeah. <laughs> It's so fascinating, though, and it's really cool that you had um, a teacher that, that kind of encouraged you to explore these areas, because often it's the opposite, right? Like normally these authority figures will kind of shut down those curiosity or those elements of curiosity that want to push boundaries. But I think it's absolutely the way to go in science is to look at the kind of most bizarre and, and unexplained problem in every mm. area and try and figure out as much as we can about those things, about those unsolved, un unexplained um as you say kind of areas right and so your background i think if i'm right in saying like you kind of studied various things at, at some point in your life you studied like zoology botany genetics paleontology tree physiology and everything like that so there's like the real kind of full circle the circle of life right like uh, kind mm. of every different area and as you've said you're interested in consciousness and parapsychology as well so you have this total this really all-encompassing um background right yeah yeah one of the main areas that, that that i've looked into that you have as a yeah one of your main research interests is these unexplained areas unexplained riddles of evolution um you said that that's something maybe you're not so up to date on it's not one of your the, the things you've been working on most recently um but i was wondering yeah if you could talk a little bit about that a little bit about the idea of the unexplained riddles or unsolved riddles of evolution and if you could share maybe a few examples um of things that you consider the, these unexplained riddles yeah well um first of all there is the origin of life so the question of how first living cells appeared on mm -hmm. planet earth and if you look into the literature even the the, the literature or, or the articles in uh, the internet whatever many people gain their information simply by looking at articles uh, from the internet that are written for the general audience the general readership they convey the impression that we all we know basically how that happened. And then every now and then you read that on this and that comet, they found this or that organic compound that is useful for building the, the first 
long chain molecules and that's so the impression that's constantly being uh, conveyed is that basically that's not a big problem we may not know the details but in general the problem is solved we know how dna uh, rna and proteins emerged but if you really look into the specialist literature that's really not the case so um Remember, my, I wrote my book back in 2007, and I follow the literature still occasionally, not in detail. But in my understanding, nothing has changed since that time. So the, the basic questions are still open. We still do not know how, uh, even if we assume that we have the building blocks to form DNA or RNA molecules, we don't know how they are linked together in a stable manner. And, you know, there are also two kinds of the building blocks that are uh, uh, prevalent in, in nature in two similar forms, like left and right hand. They call it the enantiomeres. So you only can use one of those two forms to build that block. If you build in the other type in as well, that will immediately bring the chain to a stop or rather also so the possibility to, rep to replicate it, to make a copy of it. So they're really very specific questions that need to be addressed on a let's say physiological biophysiological level in my book i special a uh, special I, I singled out i think more than 20 of those yeah even, 24 i think uh, 24 i think yeah yeah there's one i forgot to count it 25 yeah <laughs> but still even if you assume oh that's uh fine you still don't know how they really are built together in such a way that they also uh, con con um, or convey meaningful information so the point is not only how can we construct long uh, molecule chains of the, these primordial uh, building blocks, but they also need to be formed in a way that living uh, cells can do something with it or can be built from that. Mm -hmm. So that's in, in fact, it's I, I wrote, uh, read some books from authors that are concerned with intelligent design. So that's uh, something that's uh, discussed pretty controversially, of course, especially in the USA. So Stephen Meyer, he wrote uh, uh, very interesting books about that, being concerned with these very matters. And all these are questions that are barely discussed in mainstream biological outlets. And they are really severe problems that are, in my opinion, still not in, not solved. So we still don't know how life on Earth, on Earth emerged. I think this is the honest answer that any, everybody has to give. We only yeah. have some rough ideas about that. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the other question. How did these first molecules uh, or first cells, given they <laughs> evolved at one point, proliferate into all these different organisms that we find on Earth? We also find very, in my opinion, simplistic mechanisms of evolutionary progress in most of these theories. And then we find also very... And uh, the very narrow view uh, or examples that are used to um, exemplify these theories. So we hear lots of stories about animals that are perfectly shaped and, and formed to do whatever they need to do. Plants are very highly adapted to this or that. But for example, there's one kind of a large group of organisms that you hardly ever find in, in all these evolutionary textbooks. It's the fungi. And mm -hmm. I'm a big friend of fungi. And I mean, if you look at those, if you know a little bit about them, I mean, there are these basic forms that seem to be really prevalent. It's those that have a, a stem and a, and a head, yeah. of course. But there are so many other shapes of um, fungi and mushrooms. And also even within those um, subgroups that have these kind of typical shape, it's pretty obvious that the shape and the color and the details of how they are formed, like whether they have drills or pores or whatever at the, at the bottom to release their spores, it has no bearing at all on the question how in how far they are um, a rare, rare, a rare species or a very abundant and common species. So all that, the, the question of if a species of a given fungi is, is rare or not, depends on physiological um, requirements and the specificity and how far they are specified to uh, or require, uh, they, and how far they require very specific 
conditions for thriving in the soil and in the climate and the the morphological shape and the colors and everything, maybe even the size up to a certain degree, is completely irrelevant for, the, for, irrelevant for that question. So we yeah. cannot say that the morphological shape of fungi is decisive with regard to deciding if it's an abundant or a rare species or not. And maybe that might well apply to also other organisms like plants, animals, or whatever. I think it's there are several reasons to assume that the morphological appearance of bodies of organisms is not so much determined by random mutations and natural selection of the best adapted individuals. It seems to be actually kind of a ne negligible feature of organisms that's only relevant within a certain um, array, but also seems to possess certain autonomous development or manifestation dynamics that are not e exclusively explicable by these typical mechanisms of evolutionary development. Wow, that's so fascinating. And yeah, fungi are really, really fascinating in general, like with how they have, yeah, so many, so much variety and so many different uses. And obviously some of them are psychedelic and everything like that, <laughs> um, which again, kind of links into many areas of parapsychology that we're going to get to at some point in, in their own way. Um, some of the other areas that I think you've written down as unexplained riddles that I that I found on your, I think your page on the Psy Cyclopedia, I might have got this from. Mm. Um, but, and I, again, I think most of these are still probably totally unexplained and, and it's just mainstream science just kind of ignores it, doesn't it? Things that they can't explain generally like, oh yeah, let's not, let's not focus on that. Um, so hypnosis is, is a really fascinating thing that kind of seems to have really bizarre way. Well, it seems it's just a very confusing thing. If you're a physicalist, right. From the physicalist point of view, same with savant syndrome, photographic memory, false pregnancy, sudden whitening of hair. Mm -hmm. So these are all like really bizarre kind of quirks in, in reality. Um, do you have any take on like savant syndrome? Like what, how do you think, do you have a kind of opinion on how that works as it were, or how that happens? Well, it's, it's very peculiar. That's for sure. In particular regarding savants that have these enormous capacities of memory. Yeah. There are people who apparently never forgot anything that they heard, be it a piece of music, even complex piece of music like piano concert or the contents of books that they read, like a very famous um, example in this regard is Kim Peek, who mm -hmm. read even in, if the, in larger books, he read one book with one eye and uh, a page yeah. with one eye and the other page with the other eye within, within a few seconds. And he never forgot what, what was on that pages and was able to reproduce all this material apparently verbatim. So this is kind of amazing if you think of it or, or people who just listen to a complex piano concert and then pia can play that piano concert faultlessly yeah. and repeat it and never forget a note. So I wonder how th this can happen because usually it is assumed that whatever we perceive, what enters our view, we take in very much more than we are apparently aware of. And then this gets filtered through certain processes in the brain. Mm -hmm. And also uh, there's a filter that determines uh, what contents are transported kind of further into the long term uh, memory and which one, which elements are kind of shut out of that from and just kind of vanish from the short term memory and do not, are not uh, translated into the long term memory. Mm -hmm. And for long term memory, we need the formation of molecules of some structures and there are some neurophysiological processes that are seemingly involved in that, but it takes at least a few seconds to form a protein and a biomolecule that might be responsible for that. And so I wonder, for example, if there is a line of words that I just quickly uh, zoom across with my eyes uh, or a whole page within seconds and every word needs to be remembered, or if you listen to these complex piano pieces, some of these notes, they only whoop, appear for a fraction of a second mm -hmm. if, if there is a, um, a, a fast um, melody that's being played. How yeah. are these very, very short notes that are that maybe take fractions of seconds kind of 
memorized or related to processes of biomolecule biomolecule formation that takes at least several seconds how is you know there's this gap in the dimensions so some people may say well the entire pattern is somehow memorized but still you need to ha have this fine grained resolution that's not really um represented in the formation of these supposed memory traces however and wherever they may be so that's really a problem and I have no really good explanation for that, apart from saying that memory and consciousness may be more than just a bio, um, a product of the biochemistry of the brain. Yeah. Also with regard to some of these uh, calculation operations that some of the sub mm. seem to be able to perform. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I spoke to Dr. Diane Hennessy and um, another guy called Jeff Tarrant recently who have mm -hmm. done like some research into savants uh, and, and they've looked at the idea of um, that I, I, from talking to Jeff. And I think he did this with Diane, that some of these savants or all of the ones that they were with at this point in time were showing like incredible like um extrasensory perception essentially uh like psychic abilities mm. um like they were like able to get numbers like the, the the parent of the savant child would like hold a number behind their back or something or mm. and, and they'd just be able to get this information straight away and so did you did you notice that when you were looking into this phenomenon like that people that have savant uh, syndrome are often more likely to display kind of heightened let's say psychic abilities for now I heard some or read about some cases, but I haven't found really well researched cases, mm -hmm. but there are some really intriguing re reports. Um, yeah. In Germany, there is a, a twin couple. They are autist, uh, autistic people. And I don't think that they are savants, but they are autist people. And they um, were at one point able to express themselves by a certain means of communication. And so that was very interesting um, how they described uh, their way of perceiving the world because they say they had a really hard time. They, mm. when, when, for example, looking at a chair, they would just see some kind of amorphous energy swirl and only through constant interaction with other people, with the environment, they had to really learn hard what, how a chair actually looks like and probably also looks like for us how it is, uh, how, how they can use it, how, how they can sit on it. And so they have a totally different way of perceiving their environment and what is very natural for us, or well, maybe now, it, of course, it is, isn't natural when we are a baby, but mm. we have this natural capacity to experience our surroundings in such a way that we can assume that we do it like most other people around us. But for them, it's absolutely not the case. And they have some, also the teachers they, the, in this, um, teachers of these twins, um, they were interviewed. And so they, they were very interested in, even though they, they never spoke, they were very interested in very highly intellectual literature, even studying philosophical books. Mm -hmm. So you, the, the, the teachers could give them classical German treatises on this or that, maybe even philosophical works of Kant. And they would just look at that book on the table and then push it away. And then in subsequent examinations, they were able to, um, to, to, to write about, so they don't talk, but they can write, they write about that book. So they know what's in the book and they say, yeah, we don't have to read that book. We just look at it and then we know what's in there. And so it's wild. really amazing. <laughs> and they, also they seem to have a, a constant telepathical contact with each other. So they also write the same stuff. They make the same mistakes and all these things that we also sometimes hear from kind of normal, normally developed identical twins. Yeah. Which often seem to have a very strong telepathical content and it seems to be very, very much more um, pronounced in this particular case. Yeah. Wow. That's, that's fascinating. Mm. And yeah, you're right with normal, normal, like identical twins. Like that's kind of one of the areas where maybe the mainstream are slightly more open to the, these ideas that we're discussing of like psychic phenomena and things like mm. that. Like that's kind of a bit more accepted to say like, oh yeah, twins have a connection with each other and that kind of thing, which it does mm. seem to be enhanced compared to maybe normal people, but then it's something that's maybe latent in everybody. Um, is was the placebo effect in your book, or is that something like? Do you think that counts as an unexplained riddle? 
Well, it certainly is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's only one example of many yeah. other examples of what some call psychophysiological influence. It's yeah. basically the a, a mental influence on your own body, be it conscious, yeah. be it unconsciously triggered. And it's maybe one of the most accepted phenomena mm. of these kind, even yeah. though it was not accepted for a very long time because it <laughs> upsets all the medical <laughs> studies that try to develop new medicaments and all that stuff. But so, yeah, now it's it's accepted as a phenomenon, but I still think we have no explanation for that, no proper mm. explanation. Maybe we can even identify certain biomolecules that play a role there, but still we do not know how that transition from a mental expectation, be it conscious, be it subconscious, is transformed in a bodily modification. Yeah. And this can really take on really drastic um, forms, like you mentioned it already, for example, um, in contexts of hypnosis, where people can develop blisters, burn marks only on their skin, or even stigmata. I know a case yeah. in which a doctor has... Um, induced stigmata on a female person via applying hypnotic suggestions to her and then wow. and they monitored this person constantly and they were able to see like how on the skin they formed the red patch and then it, sw it got swollen a little bit and then mm -hmm. the skin cracked and the blood came out i mean these are physical effects that were only generated by a mental suggestion so that's quite amazing, and I don't think that we have an explanation for this. And then you also mentioned it already, the sudden whitening of hair. It's maybe one of the most drastic cases yeah. of this mental influence on one's own body, because hair is a dead matter. And so there is no metabolism in hair that can possibly decompose pigments or whatever. And this is, of course, one reason why it's generally uh, considered to be impossible. So mm -hmm. when you say that... I know a case in which somebody uh, turned white overnight, the general re reaction among scientists or, or uh, dermatologists and so is, oh, that's not possible. Maybe there was dye in the hair or whatever kind of alternative explanation that then washed out suddenly. Yeah. But again, I think I think it's not the case. And it's one of my, I, I performed the literature survey. It's kind of some years ago by now in which I surveyed the literature of um, back to more than 2,000 years exclusively in the medical literature in several languages. And I came up with, I think, I stopped that survey when I reached, I think, 212 cases oh, wow. described by physicians in the medical literature. And of them, there were more than 40 uh, first-hand accounts in which the physicians reported, I have seen this myself. I, there is this patient, I know he or she had dark or black hair, and she visited me few days later with white hair due to this and this um, uh, trauma or severe pain or disease. And some of these physicians even uh, took hair samples and investigated them. And they found that indeed uh, the pig pigments were destroyed or the hair was cracked. So there were even different mechanisms by this white colorations could be obtained. So in some cases, as, as I mentioned, the hair was only cracked so the white appearance was due to the, the the light beams being reflected in a particular way. And once you put that hair into water or oil, it turned brown again. While in other cases, the pigment itself was gone. And then there were combined cases in which both processes seemed to take place. So but there were really physical alterations of the hair that seemed to have occurred virtually overnight, sometimes during a few hours with a physician standing next to the bed watching the hair turning white so there are famous french physicians who reported this happening so i think it's it's it does happen and since yeah. i published this uh, papers um I, I think more than 10 people approached me saying yes i know such cases as well and two or three of them have said to me this happened to myself it happened to mm -hmm. my own hair so i think it's 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 happening even though yeah. we have don't have a metabolic um, explanation for that and that's maybe one example showing that what people often call parapsychological or psi phenomena like psychokinesis mm -hmm. is constantly happened to some degree also in our own organisms and yeah. maybe the sudden whitening of hair is nothing but a drastic example of psychokinesis it's a mental mm -hmm. influence on a body yeah. so that's maybe yeah. all that there is here. but of course it's also not a very good explanation
Yeah. Wow. Though. Yeah. But you're right. It is a it is an example of yeah the mind influencing matter. Mm-hmm. Um, that's extraordinary. I could spend ages talking about these like unexplained, unsolved riddles, and maybe we'll get to a few more next time we talk. The placebo effect, just to say a couple more words on that. Like you're right, this it, it's accepted, and it's maybe one of the stranger things that's kind of accepted by mainstream science and by you know everybody. Mm. It, it is accepted, but it feels like we haven't really you know done anything with that acceptance of it it's kind of like accepted but like oh let's not talk about it you know mm. let's let's not let's talk about as you said like th- these drugs because they're they're going to improve your condition by 35 percent or something like mm. that but let's not talk about the fact that just from a placebo you might improve your condition by 30 mm. percent um and let's and obviously if we then were able to accept properly like okay the placebo effect works why is there not more again mainstream attention on what else can we do with this how far can we take this you know what are the possibilities with this and and the power of belief the power of positive thinking and all of these kind of things it seems unbelievable to think that yes it's accepted but it's also largely ignored and like dismissed it's bizarre um yeah (laughs) yeah Wow. And I should say also this this is also only valid for the comparably decent forms of placebo or nocebo effects, but there can be uh-huh. very drastic ones like in yeah. nocebo contexts you have maybe you can you can virtually believe yourself to death. There has been yeah. one example in the medical literature recently of somebody who wanted to commit suicide and just took the whole bottle of placebo pills and was about to die <laughs> because uh-huh. he didn't know that it was only placebo pills. Yeah. And there are, of course, examples from voodoo death, curses, and all these contexts. And on the more positive side, you have all these spontaneous remissions, spontaneous healings, maybe even uh, positive effects of prayers on certain diseases mm-hmm. and all these things. And they tend to be, uh, are they are still kind of ignored, even in those settings that the, the normal placebos are now accepted. Yeah, yeah. I guess mm. one step at a time. Hopefully, we're going to get yeah. there. Hopefully, <laughs> but I think hopefully the placebo effect could be something that you know, like keeps this door open and starts to open the door a little bit wider. Are there any other unsolved riddles that you think are worth mentioning before we move on to to some other phenomena? Yeah, you mean you're like biological riddles? I mean, yeah, anything there, basically there that was are, in your book of the, the consciousness <laughs> and or you know the 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 near death phenomena of various yeah. kinds they they uh, offer many unsolved yeah, uh, riddles and questions and yeah so they are yeah. all also some type of biological riddles of course i guess i just meant if there was one like from your book that was mm. kind of like burning in your brain on the edge of your mouth wanting to talk about like because of us talking about these things maybe it reminded you of something so if there's nothing like kind of desperate to to come out that's fine that's why i was well, maybe i mean there's one thing and it leads already to the more mind related and consciousness mm-hmm. related riddles it's some uh, forms of brain anomalies that okay. are seemingly not mirrored by mind anomalies if you like for example there are these uh, very extreme cases of people with hydrocephalus mm. uh, who have um, not the normally developed brain but due to some developmental difficulties they have uh, this large area of um, hollow space in their brain that is merely filled with cerebrospinal fluid and the brain itself is only pressed to the inside of the skull so maybe there can be a layer of half a centimeter a centimeter whatever but the the neocortex the 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 large two beautiful hemispheres that normally develop brains typically um, possess are not yeah. present at all in some of these cases. So this usually re- results in, spe- in, in uh, concomitant uh, mental deficits, but not always. And I find this quite amazing mm. because both the, the macro and the micro anatomy of the brain is severely compromised. In some cases, certain brain structures are not even detectable in these patients, like the visual cortex, the corpus callosum, and you name it. It's all kind of pressed together somewhere on the inside of the skull, and still the brain seems to function normally. And so this raises serious questions about the normally assumed um, role of these anatomical structures of the brain both on the macro and the micro level which can easily be disturbed in normal cases with resulting um, disturbances of the mind 
So why is it that in some cases, such drastic disturbances do seemingly not affect the mind? Mm. And this is one example. And also turning back to the question of memory, we find some cases in which people have some very strange brain diseases and the only remedy is to take one brain hemisphere out of their skull or to at least cut it from their uh, um, connections with the rest of the brain so to make it functionally um, useless, if you like, so it cannot interfere or the, the disease cannot spread. And... What I find very fascinating that is even if you remove such a hemisphere, memory of these affected persons is apparently not impaired at all. Yeah. And so even if you say that, well, we know now that memory traces are not like written in a book in a specific row of molecules codes for a specific memory, that's not the case. People have until today not found any place in the brain where specific memories are located. So that's why they say, well, it's somewhere all around the brain. And there are, of course, some certain structures that seem to enable memory access. And if they are disturbed, it's not easy to remember this and that. But still, if you take out an entire hemisphere, this doesn't affect memory at all. And this is quite amazing if you think that memory is exclusively stored in the brain and you need the entire brain for mediating all these memories. Yeah, that is that's absolutely fascinating. Wow. Um, I got a question here that's going to kind of transition us from talking about, you know, some some evolution stuff to play, talking more about these anomalous um, phenomena. This one I owe to Stanley Krippner. You probably uh, know, know Stanley Krippner. Um, mm. So what role, if any, did anomalous experiences uh, play in human evolution? So what role, if any, did anomalous experiences such as NDEs, uh, near-death experiences, um, uh, healing, precognitive dreams, and all of this kind of stuff that, that we're talking about, what role do you think they could have played in, in human evolution, if any? Well, I think this may more be relevant for the let's say the cultural evolution mm -hmm. so i i do think that in the early days when and kind of indigenous or um, people or those who lived thousands of years ago they put very much weight on for example their dreams and yeah. they also were certainly confronted very often with life threatening life critical situations and we know that these are situations that may trigger extraordinary experiences of various kinds including near-death experiences and i can very well imagine that this led to the formation of religions and to certain rituals and cults and and so on so mm -hmm. we still find examples of such cultures within the australian aboriginal people and and other 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 people so i think in the cultural on the cultural level this certainly played a, uh, an important role. And maybe that's also one reason why in some modern cultures this got lost because we just don't pay attention to our dreams and all these other experiences in, in this similar way. We consider yeah. them to be some farts of the brain or hallucinations and whatever. But in early days, this was not the case. Yeah. Now, in how far this may have also affected um the somatic and the bodily evolution of uh, humans i don't know because humanoid uh, creatures have been around for very long and mm -hmm. also today you find uh, all the apes and, and monkeys on this planet and so the question of how certain ancestors developed into what are today human beings is difficult to say but again uh, um what i find very interesting in um, uh, terms of evolution are the reincarnation cases like mm -hmm. in which children as soon as they start to talk claim to have lived before yeah saying yeah i lived there and there i had a different mother different child i died in this and this way and, mm -hmm. and it's very interesting that this also happens in families that are entirely unrelated and also in about one third of the cases, these children have um, bodily or somatic correspondences that um, resemble or, or that correspond with somatic features of the person whose life they uh, claim to remember. Yeah. And this, again, is very interesting from an evolutionary point of view. 
because it indicates that some traits, be they mental, like memories or maybe behavioral, maybe they have a phobia, a phobia mm -hmm. from drowning, from fire, whatever, may also be transmitted via non-genetic lineages and may result in the formation of, well, if you think that maybe something similar can happen already in animals, at least in higher developed animals, may form um, the base, basis for the development of new instincts or of new thoughts, and may thus play another um, or strengthening role of certain evolutionary elements. And it may even affect the body, because if, if there are these correspondences between generations that are not even related on a physical level, on a genetic level, that might indicate that there is kind of a background reality, kind of a consciousness related substrate that all life is rooted in and maybe evolution is to some extent driven uh, from these uh, changes that are mediated via this background reality yeah. and that, that's actually something that i i i thinking that i i sympathize with so that experiences that we make or potentially also monkeys and apes make gets kind of fed into this background reality and then kind of mingles with this, I, I don't know, maybe some kind of collective unconscious that's related to a given group of similar animals or species, and which in turn affects the um, development of the newborn individuals as well, and thereby contributes to evolution. Yeah. So maybe that's one way to in which even such experiences in very early days can have affected um the bodily changes also from apes to humans, whatever in these ways, you know, mm -hmm. it's maybe it's not too different from uh, placebo effects and all these other mentally induced effects yeah. on bodies. Maybe that's only a matter of context, a matter of degree. But I do think that there are some consciousness driven aspect to evolution. Yeah, absolutely. I, I agree. And it sounds it all sounds very logical what you're saying. And and in fact, if these children in these cases, which are very solid cases, and there's a lot of them, if if they are real, right, if they're actual cases of reincarnation, then that would make sense that that's played a part in evolution in, you know, quite a large way, probably in how we could kind of talk about how and why and the intricacies for a long, long time. And we could debate that. But but yeah, I mean, it seems pretty obvious that if they're real it should have had an impact and what you were saying about like yeah the the different level of the impact of our consciousness or our mind having on the body like the placebo effect the different levels i think in some of these reincarnation cases like um they they have you know the child will have a corresponding mark from the previous life but sometimes the previous personality would have also had another mark that was maybe more obvious physically but mm. because it didn't seem to affect them as much emotionally it didn't seem to come through on the new body. It just kind of like was 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 lost with the body that died. But then the one that yeah seems to seems to be most present on the the new incarnation is the one that yeah was like either the mode of death or something mm. related to something that was a very you know meaningful thing that this person went through or emotional uh, traumatic kind of experiences those kind of things. I find that really interesting because it's not just yeah like oh a really bad physical wound. It's, it doesn't seem to necessarily be affected by just how bad it was physically it's more like mm. yeah the impact it could have had emotionally um yeah such fascinating stuff yeah and it can also affect uh, or concern more general bodily features like the size of the body the mm. skin color and so they're very interesting cases again That's when you true, look at yeah. twin cases for example we know several cases that ian stevens in the main researcher who did that work he, he's um or in which couples or close friends died or were murdered and were seemingly re reborn as twins right. and so in these cases you find that like if if you have let's say a couple one is um short one is tall one is dark skin and the other has light skin and so on and this is often um found again in these um, reincarnated twins so they even if they are identical twins they might con uh, differ considerably with regard to their body stature their size the skin color but this would then match the differences that had um, already be pertaining to the couple 
who died. So yeah. all these are very interesting, yeah, very, very absolutely. interesting, absolutely fascinating things like to pursue. And stuff. I think, yeah, one could also re really pursue large scale research on all these matters, but it's unfortunately still not the case. Yeah, yeah. Again, hopefully, the, as time passes and as these things become more talked about and more known, that I don't see how the doors are not going to be blown off. I don't see how way more people are not going to become interested and want to research these things and fund these things. I think it has to. I think it has to progress in that way because once you look into it, once you look into the research and the evidence, like there's so much there that it's. It, it's essentially indisputable that there's something going on that's way more mysterious than the reality that we kind of accept as as children like oh yeah okay that's all there is to it that's just that's fine um yeah it's just so clear that there's more to it so do you think uh, biology will one day be able to explain consciousness and psychic phenomena do you think one day we'll have yeah a, a reasonable explanation um from from yeah say biology or science well, I think it depends on what, what you regard as an explanation. I think if you think of it, we would have to explain consciousness with consciousness. And this is very difficult by itself. I mean, if, if you want to explain something, at least in the normal world of science, you always have to have an external perspective. You cannot explain something from an internal perspective because then, you know, there's always necessarily missing, namely yeah. the outside perspective. So this is one reason why I think that consciousness might be very difficult to really explain because we only have consciousness to explain consciousness. And yeah. so, and I think that's also one problem that we actually have in science that humans, uh, they tend to think we can explain the world. We know how logic works. We can construct all these fine machines and computers and we have this medicine and all. we are really smart guys. And we can understand also how the cosmos works, how life began, mm -hmm. all these things. But I think they're, they're, they're vastly over, um, what's the word, overestimating exactly. the, the powers yeah. of logic, because much yeah. in life and much of the universe might not be following the rules of logic and efficient causation. Mm -hmm. So in my view, it's rather time to accept or to to kind of um, reduce our, our our proudness of the logical human mind and accept that there will very likely be things that we cannot explain in the ways that we would like them to explain. Yeah, I believe uh, you, you can explain a computer and a machine and look for the details how it works. This might not be possible in the same way when you want to explain consciousness. I mean, yeah. we don't even know what time and space is. And time and space are very likely <laughs> closely related to conscious experience. Yeah. I don't think that time and space is something objectively given that's completely independent for us or of us. And that I think it's a misconception. You know, mm -hmm. yeah, we should, in fact, take the limitations of what we know and what we can know much more seriously and also yeah. not expect that. You know, it's when people say, ah, we cannot explain this and that, and therefore it doesn't exist. I, I, I hear this very often, specifically with regard to psi phenomena or even with regard to UFOs. So people say, well, there is uh, nothing can travel faster than light and the, all the stars are so far away. Mm -hmm. And so UFOs cannot come here. Possibly it's not possible because of speed of light. And so, mm, But that's not the way that you want to think in science. I think there are phenomena that are definitely here and we have to accept their existence, even though we have no explanation for them. And even though we might not be able to explain them fully with our logic alone. Yeah. Yeah, you're right. It's an anti-scientific approach to say mm. that, yeah, just because science can't explain it, it can't be real. And also you're so right that things like consciousness, maybe they don't fit into a box that is ever going to be convenient for an explanation maybe i'm sure we're going to learn more about it mm. i'm sure that's possible that we can increase our knowledge and our understanding mm. but to be able to yeah put it in like a, a nicely packaged okay here we go that's how it works yeah that's another question and i'm sure mm. you're the same as me the more i understand and the more i research and the more i learn about things in these areas the more i'm just totally convinced that reality is just 
far more mysterious and bizarre than than we can kind of really imagine like it just every time you start to think maybe i kind of understand that phenomenon a little bit like reincarnation like maybe i kind of get that then you'll hear about some case that will just be like how does that you know how does that fit with the other cases that kind of conflicting stuff sometimes where it's yeah it's um kind of like you hear people say the trickster element in these kind of phenomena and and that kind of feels very present in in all of this stuff um to move on to another area i recently we talked briefly before we got into this interview i recently read one of your papers or a paper that you you wrote with lots of other people and it's called terminal lucidity in a pediatric mm-hmm. oncology clinic mm-hmm. and it was published in the journal of nervous and mental disease um and yeah the the list of authors was uh, very impressive that that was on that with you um so i guess first what is terminal lucidity how long has it been documented for and and what can it tell us it's kind of a big question but yeah just uh yeah firstly Mm -hmm. what what is it is the most important thing for people that might not be aware Mm -hmm. well terminal lucidity describes um an unexpected surge of mental clarity shortly before dying so that's Mm -hmm. the very general phrase and this obviously implies that people who display episodes of terminal lucidity have been previously in a drowsy, confused, demented, unconscious, even comatose state. So you wouldn't expect those people to react in this way. So they're just to give you a very drastic example that was related to me, actually by, by a friend of mine, concerning his uh, grandmother. Oh, wow. She had Alzheimer's disease, which is a severely neurodegenerative disease, deconstructing the brain with all that comes along with it. And she's had it for 15 years and for only five years she did not uh, speak anymore and also did not recognize the people around her. She was uh, staying in the house of one of her daughters who cared for her and she even didn't recognize her own daughter anymore for five years. Basically spent her time lying laying in in her bed, not saying uh, and doing anything. And all of a sudden this woman sat up in, in bed and her, her two daughters were present at the time. And then he, she started to have a normal conversation with them about mm, her fear of dying, problems she had with certain attitudes of the church. And she inquired about the well-being of certain family members. And so this went on for quite a while. And then she laid back in her bed and died a few hours later. Uh, she lied back and returned into this comatose like non-responsive state and from there from that state did she then shortly after died and this is very very amazing because you wouldn't expect this to happen after so many years and so yeah but that's only very drastic example many episodes of terminal acidity are not that drastic but they can even they can only um exist um or imply like people suddenly opening their eyes giving a meaningful glance to people at their bedside or so on. This can also already count as a terminal lucidity if it concerns people who have been unconscious or not responsive for quite some time before. Yeah. And how long is it around? I think these phenomena are around for a very long time. Um, I, I performed, again, literature survey. That's, I like a lot studying old literature on unusual phenomena, like yeah. white, sudden whitening of hair, this, that, a, also these unusual episodes of... It's a very useful service you're doing there. Mental clarity in, uh, in, the, in the literature. Yeah, and I like it a lot because if you look in the literature like 200 years ago, 100 years ago, the people were much more open to unusual phenomena. The scientific disciplines... We're just about to consolidate and people didn't really have those fixed and rigid concepts of this is physics, this is biology, this is mm-hmm. it's psychology, this is chemistry. And this is so impossible. They, <laughs> yeah, yeah, this is, this is bullshit. <laughs> so they, they just collected reports and, and phenomena and tried to make sense of them. And yeah. only within the years and decades and this increasing focus on positivist, mechanist worldviews, they came kind of, a, it all narrowed down and it came more rigid and separated in different disciplines. Like, But if you look at the times of German Romanticism, a time I like very much, um, German Romanticists put much weight on that if you study nature, you have to believe, have to have a broad overview on very many different topics. Mm-hmm. Uh, or, and not only one specific topic. So all all, all 
kinds of um, matters related to life and nature were considered to be important for uh, natural scientists in this age, even arts. So science was often regarded as a kind of an art. So people didn't really even distinguish between art and science at that time. And I think this was a very cool and very useful approach. Yes, and so I found that um, people at these times reported some of these cases and at times in considerable detail. And so I collected them and yeah, systematized them and gave it a name. It's uh, what I found is apparently very important for humans to give something a name. So there were all these reports out there and reports already, in fact, date back to antiquity, to physicians who noted that even insane people or however they would have been called turned to be fairly normal shortly before they died, mm. known since antiquity. But it didn't really have a name. And so I, I tried to find a name also with Bruce Grayson and we came up finally with the word terminal lucidity. And so if, if you do that, you, you and give something a name, it becomes kind of an entity and then it can be researched and then it can be addressed and then it can, can be discussed. We find it uh, was a very similar uh, thing with near-death experiences. They have been yeah. around for centuries and literature also from German Romanticism and other contexts is full of reports of near-death experiences and even in parapsychology they were discussed for a long time. But only when Raymond Moody wrote this book in 1975 and came up with a cool and catchy term yeah. and the book became a bestseller, then near-death experiences became a subject that can be researched and studied. Yeah, and this is this is how it happened. And I didn't this, realize yeah. that you kind of were involved in coining the term. term oh, yeah. Lucidity. Yeah. 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 That's yeah, cool. Yeah. Nice. Wow. Yeah. So I, I was in contact with Bruce Grayson at that time, and I had this uh, idea to call it terminal lucidity or terminal lucidity experiences yeah. relating to near-death experiences. And so I discussed it with Bruce, and he said, nah, better just call it terminal lucidity. And so this is <laughs> how it actually then went into uh, the literature. Yeah. Awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's really cool. Yeah, I didn't realize that. Wow. Well, congratulations mm. on coining that term. So mm. how did you search for the stuff in the historical record then if there was no like, you know, no kind of uh, name, as you say, to, to help you in your mm. search? What, what were you looking for exactly? Well, I just read publications and literature and followed all these references. Yeah. And then um, some authors also uh, mainly in the 19th century they mm -hmm. had some small case collections of such cases and it was very difficult to find because at these yeah. times sometimes this, the the references were wrong the names were wrong the page numbers were wrong the journals were given in different names so this was quite some work to really find all those references and to identify them and to obtain all these very old and very rare books so these days all these uh, literature searches have become much more easy because mm -hmm. especially books from the 19th century are now available also online in certain uh, sources like Google Docs or archive.org. And so you can find them, but it wasn't the case maybe 20 years ago. And so I really had to get those books from weird, <laughs> um, uh, what's the word, you, um, libraries and all that. So, mm -hmm. But it was fun. It was like, like yeah. digging for treasures. Yeah. And of course, some people um, of more recent times also put um, already their interest on such cases like Peter Fennick yeah. and his team. He worked in the UK uh, with, uh, in hospices and palliative stations, and he did some surveys and questionnaires, and they covered also or had questions in their surveys pertaining to such unusual episodes of lucidity mm -hmm. and a few other authors as well like also um, Ed Kelly, Bruce Grayson, they had some examples in their very remarkable and recommendable book, um, Irreducible Mind. So yeah. this was a book that I really inspired me a lot and which I consider one of the best books ever written, I have to say. There's also yeah. much interesting uh, stuff in there about uh, psychophysiological influence, a very important mm -hmm. chapter by Emily Kelly. So that's a really great book. Yeah, and so I've got I, it on I my shelf the in dots, the other room. Yeah, you know. Yeah. yeah, it's the next one on my reading list. It's going to take me like a year, I think. It's yeah, like but it's worth it. It's like a massive dictionary. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah worth yeah. it, I'm sure. And and I'm a big fan of Ed Kelly and his mm. work as well. Um, when did you when did you come up with that name? What year was that? Do you remember? 2009. 
2009. Wow. Yeah. And since then, I guess, yeah, it has become a very accepted and, and used and not accepted by the mainstream necessarily, but it's a very used and, and yeah, it's become quite well known, right? This, this term mm. and this phenomenon. Um, wow. So hopefully that's just going to continue to go from strength to strength and become more observed and more mm. researched mm. as the years go by. Yeah. You, has it so been, incidentally, I, I just, uh, just recently I performed an internet search for the the term terminal acidity in 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 you know um quotation marks yeah. to really yeah. uh, 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 get hits to that refer to that complete term and yeah. i found that there are at least one or two music bands bearing that name and i think there's more than 10 songs really? <laughs> of the name of terminal acidity and even yeah, well. one climbing route in a very dangerous rock face <laughs> <laughs> so people <laughs> seemingly uh, adopt it to very many yeah. different contexts. And it's quite funny and I like it. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. It's like totally ingrained already in like culture yeah. and stuff yeah. like that in society. And and as we say, it's only like 15 years ago. So mm. that's going to yeah. become more ingrained. And hopefully we're going to learn more about it. We're going to hear more people's experiences, more accounts, because um, it is such a fascinating phenomenon. Like the the cases in the paper that I read were like one of them almost like brought me to tears because it was like they're, they're really kind of like touching you know cases because mm. obviously you're dealing with people on, in their last moments and they can have these these brief moments or minutes or hours even of connection with like their loved ones and like powerful stuff um and it, it happens in patients with dementia have you aware of cases like of patients that have dementia and i i specifically mentioned that i know you talked about the one in with alzheimer's but like i have you know like i had family that had dementia and stuff so it's kind of a bit more personal a bit closer to my my heart and i was wondering yeah are you aware of cases yeah in which the 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 patient that had the t terminal lucidity moment had had uh dementia Oh yeah, it happens in all kinds of different contexts and it even happens with people who die with healthy brains because also they can be non-responsive, confused, depending on what state of health yeah. they are. Like if you several cancer patients die with a healthy brain but still are non-responsive shortly before dying for days or weeks because of metabolic um, issues going on in their brains and so on. So the brain condition is actually not a decisive factor for terminal lucidity to occur. It can occur in people who would die with uh, tumors in their brain, who, people who had strokes, people with meningitis, so people with very severe neurological damage. But as mm -hmm. I said, also in people without any neurological long-term damage at all. And as it seems, but this is something that future research needs to bring out more uh, detailedly, these episodes don't really differ from each other as well. So mm -hmm. you cannot even, or, or, or let's put it this way, it seems to be very similar if non-responsive people pop up suddenly in their beds and become clear again, this can happen under all these different brain conditions. So this alone questions in how far the brain plays a decisive role in these processes. Yeah. And secondly, there is also an element that is very frequently reported in the context of terminal lucidity. These are near death or deathbed visions, as some people like to call them. So people suddenly open their eyes and look to the corner of the room and say, ah, hey, there's this or that disease person, maybe also a spiritual figure that seems to come and prepare the moribund people for their transition, or they may get glimpses into a, whatever, a, an afterlife realm or a, a light shining in the corner of the room. Mm. And we find this very often also in, um, in the literature on parapsychology and near-death phenomena, these near-death visions, even outside the context of terminal lucidity. And this these near-death visions are very interesting on their own and they also yeah. link terminal lucidity to near-death experiences and all these other types of, kind of spiritual experiences that occur in near-death states yeah, so that's, that's also one element that um, i think is very important that we should not only look at one specific phenomenon and try to find one explanation for one phenomenon. But it's, when you look at all these near-death phenomena, they're all somehow interrelated. 
even in the reincarnation cases, we find several reports. I think it's about one fifth of the cases in which the children also report what about things they allegedly experienced in the interim period between yeah. their death and their supposed the rebirth. And it, it's very similar to what other people report from, for example, near death experiences. They leave their body, see what happens from above, and then enter some afterlife realm. And mm. it's all very related, you see. And yeah. we have to take this into account if we want to develop explanatory models for these types of phenomena. Yeah, absolutely. All the connections and the, the parallels and the fact that it is so interconnected and interrelated is what makes it all so convincing and so compelling and so hard to to dispute or even to come up with alternative like to, to say oh yeah this is a possible normal explanation and what you were saying about like um on the deathbed they kind of like yeah like often will look into a direction and it'll be like they'll seem like they're communicating with yeah some you know something that we can't see that the people there can't see necessarily although sometimes maybe they can in some cases mm -hmm. that would kind of that would be more like along the lines of shared death experiences but it made me think of um you know like the last words of steve jobs everybody knows who steve jobs is and his last words like as he died he i think he looked like away from his family he looked like over their heads like into the corner of the room or whatever and smiled and said oh wow oh wow mm -hmm. oh wow and that was like his last words and like mm -hmm. that's that's pretty cool i think that's pretty uh interesting because i didn't get mm -hmm. a vibe that he was a particularly spiritual person or anything like that or you know i'm not sure if he was aware of uh terminal lucidity and things like that um so yeah pretty pretty interesting and and such a fascinating phenomenon um is there other than the example that you shared is there one example that really jumps out to you and stands out to you um of somebody that had yeah like a, a really bad neurodegenerative condition that essentially would have made their terminal lucidity like impossible by like you know normal uh normal understanding like just the the most unlikely case mm -hmm. for example that, that you can think of is there one that you have in mind yeah <laughs> actually two or three yeah yeah uh, they or some of them that two cases concern stroke patients mm -hmm. who have been as the record goes completely paralyzed due to their strokes so they were only able to move their eyes or communicate with their eyes wow so in you apparently they they have been mentally clear so it's debatable if it's really an episode of terminal lucidity but at least they couldn't communicate and couldn't move at all and all mm -hmm. of a sudden also these people set up in their beds even raised their arms and shouted out the name of a deceased loved one had a near-death vision and sank back in their beds and then died wow so this is kind of remarkable because these people had apparently been paralyzed before. Mm. So how is it that they suddenly move their body again? So this is, you ask for some kind of impossible cases. So if they really occurred in this way, and in our third case, which is similar again, it's not really explicable in neurophysiological terms and might perhaps also form a bridge into the areas of psychokinesis you know that mm. very very strong emotion may move a limb or whatever even without the uh, requiring an intact neurophysiological uh, pathway maybe that's how it can still work even in such drastic cases yeah so these are this is one type of the kind of impossible cases i'd like to mention and the other type is it concerns um, dementia patients and stage Alzheimer uh, patients. Uh, there is, I think I know two cases in which they, for some reason, suddenly came to themselves and they said, hey, I've been here all, all the time. I hovered above the bed. I was up at the ceiling all these months, whatever. And I observed everything, but just was not able to connect with my body. And then they thanked the caregivers for whatever they did and so on. And then in, in one case, uh, this uh, person then died. And in the other case, uh, she continued to actually to live for some uh, months or so. 
But that's also quite amazing because these out-of-body experiences, they are known from other contexts like near-death experiences and so on. But it's unusual to, to think that they may also occur in end-stage Alzheimer patients who are typically also not able to report about these experiences and typically then just die at some point. But yeah. in, in these cases of terminal lucidity, that's apparently what some of them do report. And this is quite spooky if you think of it. Yeah. If if that really would happen on a kind of a regular scale, maybe not in each case. You never we don't we have no idea if this is a oft a frequent phenomenon or if it's the rare exception or but but yeah. it, it can all be studied, even study if even if studying these near death phenomena is very tricky for different reasons, of course. There are possibilities to study these cases and to take them seriously. I think that's also one of the really most important things that um, we need to consider, that we need yeah. to take these cases seriously in the first case yeah. and not just put them away as some weird or impossible stuff that people report for or misreport or they're deceived or, or make the stories or whatever. There are many reasons for uh, considering such stories to be untrue. Yeah, but they are too frequent to treat them in this way. Yeah, absolutely. They need to be taken seriously. They need to be like medical professionals need to be yeah. educated about them, and they need to be like encourage people need to be encouraged or or at least told they are allowed to report these things if they have any experiences that don't conform, you know, to their understanding. If they have any interesting experiences, even we should want to know what they are. Mm. Um, and then I think you're right. I think we'd see a lot more of these. We might see that they're not so much the exception. It's like with the reincarnation cases. Are they ex are they the exception, mm. or is it just that everything mm. suppresses these memories, and you're encouraged to not have them, and, mm. and maybe we don't notice them because we don't look for them in in mm. 99 of cases in in Western society. Um, but yeah, I mean the cases you talked about with the dementia patients, like saying that they were above their body and like couldn't connect back to their body. That's so fascinating and kind of uplifting to hear in a way. Um, and it made me think of another. A uh, case of terminal lucidity that I heard about from, like, I saw a video of a hospice nurse, like, recounting her experience with a, a patient just after it had happened. And um, so it was a husband and wife. I think the husband was, like, you know, on the edge of death. Um, and I think he'd been kind of, like, in and out of consciousness for a few weeks, maybe not very responsive, you know, like, kind of in bed most of the time. Like, just, yeah, not talking, staring, sometimes staring off into the other direction. And, um, I'll try and kind of make this as brief as I can. The the hospice, um, no, the the wife wanted to tell her husband about somebody they knew that had died. And so she started to say, like, she had a rare moment where he was seeming to be a little bit responsive. And so she was like, oh, I wanted to tell you that, you know, this person, I, I didn't know how to tell you, but, you know, this lady has died or whatever. And he's like, oh, yeah, I know. She was really worried about how he's going to react. He, he's like, oh, yeah, I know. And, and she's like, oh, how, how do you know and stuff? And he's like, oh, I, I I can't remember the reason he gave, but it was essentially, he wasn't shocked at all. Wasn't surprised. Mm -hmm. He's like, I know. And then she's like, what have you been staring at when you're staring over there in the room? And I, he said, I think Jesus. And again, like everybody, as you said, a, a, people seem to see their own entity that corresponds to their own belief system or what have you. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, again, I guess normally we think of that with NDEs that you could maybe gain knowledge that you didn't know, you know, in you couldn't have known from normal means, but it seems like maybe in these cases of like a uh, terminal lucidity or where we kind of are slipping between life and death, maybe in this kind of transition, our consciousness is in some kind of transition or pulsation between these two kind of areas. Um, maybe we're able to access that information in, in other ways. Um, Terminal lucidity is also something that shows in animals sometimes, right? Like there's obviously a lot less cases of it because humans, we have a far easier time talking mm -hmm. to humans and getting information from <laughs> humans. Um, but yeah, like have you, how many cases like that have you come across and, and what are your thoughts on the yeah, terminal lucidity presenting in animals? Mm. Okay, Non-human yeah. animals, I should say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I have written a paper with Rupert Chedrick about this very recently, but um, I come to this in a second. But let me just return sure, a form sure. uh, to terminal lucidity also in humans and to these remarkable cases um, I mentioned for for a minute. Because mm -hmm. one thing I'd like to add is that again, we should uh, not just ask, "Can this be possible?" Like, can stroke 
patients, or, or let's or let's take the um, the um, Alzheimer patients, can they really have intact consciousness with destroyed brains and experience out of body experiences or not? Mm -hmm. If we want to address such questions, it's again important to look left and right. Like we know, I mentioned the near-death experiences already, so we know several cases in which people with severely compromised brain activities had then um, out-of-body experiences and were able to provide veridical accounts of what happened in their surroundings. And I would like to um, point to another intriguing field of research that's not much known. It's um, scanning the brains of comatose people. And there, I, I'm aware of two people Specifically, uh, one case that was published by Adrian Owen, who is a very renowned um, micro, uh, neuropsychiatrist, whatever, who develops methods of communication with comatose people. So one um, thing that he does in, in the co context of his work is he puts these people in the fMRI scanner and scans the brain, um, at, uh, applies certain stimuli to the brain and looks which areas of the brain react. And then he concludes whether there is some consciousness left in these comatose bodies or not, depending on what the brain does. And so he published this one case about um, a guy he, he called Juan, who was examined twice in this scanner, and his brain did not react at all to the stimuli. It seemed to be completely out of function. So he told his parents and the, uh, the physicians were... Uh, in agreement that there is absolutely nobody in there. So he was as comatose as one can be. There's even such a scale that the physicians have, the Glasgow Coma Scale. So he was at the absolute minimum because of his somatic re uh, reactionlessness and also the brain scans. But this mm -hmm. one revived at one point came to himself and he remembered everything perfectly. He had a perfect recall of all that had been done to him during these two examinations in Adrian Owen's lab. And this is very remarkable because this is um, one of the very few cases in which a brain was scanned and not only with an EEG. Sometimes we find cases with EEGs and an argument goes like this, yeah, the EEG is very superficial. Maybe there was brain activity down deep down in the deeper layers of the brain that mediated conscious experience. But in this case, we know that the brain was also deep down inside non-functional and should not have been able to process all these perceptions and to store the memories in uh, this brain because it was simply not functioning. So we have... Good evidence. I know a second very similar case that consciousness can apparently be existing even in non-functional brains. And so we don't even have to, uh, or we have to uh, include also these cases and they don't even occur in near-death states, but we can work with comatose or otherwise impaired people during their lifetime already. And so if we know this already and can establish this more succinctly and and maybe find out more about this, then we can or should put this into context also with these kind of extraordinary types of um, uh, terminal lucidity, because yeah. then they are not that exceptional anymore if we know similar uh, things from related contexts. Yeah. So this wow. is just what I wanted to, to add here. There's very yeah, well, thank interesting things that. going on that are often not connected. So, and I think we need really to connect all these yeah, like different said, areas connect of research. The dots. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, no, it's super fascinating. Comas, yeah. like patients in coma. I think that when I spoke to Bruce Grayson for the first time, like a year or two ago, in fact, the only time so far, I'm going to hopefully speak to him again soon. I, I asked him about that, like, you know, if there were patients, I think I asked him about that, like patients that had like a kind of near-death experience in a coma. And yeah, I find that such a fascinating area because it just seems like we just don't really, or like for most of my life, it, it felt like we didn't really know anything about patients who were in a coma. Like, are they alive? Are they dead? What's going on there? Mm -hmm. Are they? Is there anybody at home kind of thing? Mm -hmm. Wow. Did did the guy, are you aware whether the guy that kind of recalled stuff, did he say he recalled it from, and you might not know, he might not have specified whether he recalled it from the point of view of being inside his body or was he maybe like the, the other people that you mentioned in the terminal lucidity case, the Alzheimer's case, like above his body, potentially looking down or something along those lines? 
it seemed to me that he perceived all this from the inside perspective. Interesting. Yeah, very interesting. Yeah, yeah kind and of like the, I mentioned I know a second case. It's an Israeli case from yeah. Israel. And then this case, it actually started with kind of an out of body experience. A person just collapsed, was transported in a hospital. And so his memory set in when he just followed a guy who was being transported into a hospital from an outside perspective until he realized, hey, that's me who's being oh, transported wow. into that hospital. But then it yeah. shifted into the inside perspective as well. And so he stayed in that body, in that non-responsive body in the hospital for, I think, four days or something. Yeah. Not so long. But he was perfectly conscious all the time. And also they, they put him in the scanner and declared him brain dead and said, he will never make it and he will die. And, more. and, and, and he heard all that. And, and 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 he could also see unless uh, until they they shut his eyes and 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 so and he got memorized everything so also in this case also the brain or whatever was also able to to establish long term memories that proved to be perfectly accurate and in this case it was it, it could all be confirmed and they have apparently also revised the protocols in Israel about how to deal with non-responsive comatose people because of his experience. And so he he goes around in Israel and um, gives um, talks about this, about his experience, because it was, of course, a hor horrifying uh, experience for him, like people standing all around his bed and discussing his his uh, his death and everything, and he will never recover, and and if he will be severely retarded or whatever. Mm. And so, yeah, that's a very cool case. There is a, a quite an extensive documentary film that I know, and I'm actually trying to get in contact with him, but it mm. seems due to the current developments in in Israel difficult so i'm unfortunately i didn't succeed until now so i don't know if this uh, if i can make it but yeah these are things that really need to be known much more also in in the medical setting and among nurses among carers and yeah so what what they they do of course know that people who are non-responsive they sometimes they hear everything mm. but but what they apparently don't know is that also people who have a proven dysfunctional brain they also can hear so this is what they so in case they know now now, now we scanned that person his brain is shut down now we can speak about him like mm -hmm, because now we know that there's nobody in there but even in these cases there can be somebody in there and it's something yeah. very extraordinary if you think of it yeah definitely that they yeah as you say they can hear they can remember they can translate those memories and be able to talk about them afterwards it's fascinating do, do you know the guy's name off the top of your head, the Israeli guy? Yeah, it's Gil Avni. Gil Avni, okay. Yeah, well, I'll try I can send that spellings. to you. If you Google for him, it's and sent the, I sent the name to you. But yeah, cool. The film Thank is you. unfortunately only in Israeli and uh, in, in Hebrew and in German, but not. Mm -hmm. I think it's not available in English. No, but you got lucky. I hope to. German. I hope to <laughs> get a hold on it and publicize it also in English in one way or another. Yeah, and it's also, yeah, of course, cool. if you think of it, these cases are also very important for the context of organ donation. Mm, yeah, because, absolutely. So these the, these Juan or Gil, they would have been perfect candidates for organ donation and being yeah. just transported, uh, you know, wait, yeah. uh, for, and used for these um, types of things because one of the criteria for organ donation is brain death. And it's a terrifying thought that, yeah, yeah, the doctors could be having that conversation. Oh, yeah, we're going to take his heart for this patient, take his this yeah. for this patient. And you're just there, like listening, probably in, you know, yeah. in, in in your way, you're like trying to scream like, no, I'm here. Yeah. But you just you're, like locked in like, um yeah, that's, that's yeah. wild. I think there's, so, a yeah, film... there's one one thing that I, I should uh, I'd like to mention also connecting some dots. It's only an anecdote. I don't know if it's true, but in the context of my work on sudden whitening of hair, I came across a report saying that um, well, the people agreed about the, what their son was in a suitable condition for organ donation. They agreed that he can be um, used for that. And then when all was over, they were again allowed to to see his body, and then his hair had been white. Oh, so wow. in in this case, that's at least how the record goes. 
the hair of the person whose organs had been taken out, um, the hair turned white during this procedure, which may indicate that in this case there was somebody in there. Yeah, yeah. And big, they don't even trauma. receive the pain medications and nothing. Wow. Yeah. That's wild to think about. Like the implications of all this go, yeah, they're they're huge and they're practical implications mm. as well, beyond just beyond just trying to understand more about reality. Um, yeah, so fascinating. I think there's a, a movie, yeah, somewhere that, that kind of goes along the lines of a patient being in a coma and um I can't remember the name of it now, but if I remember I'll try and link mm. it in the description and maybe send it to you. You might find it interesting. Yeah, um, certainly. And as you were saying about like in the coma, they don't need to be they're not necessarily close to death, like physically. And that happens in other contexts too, right? Like people can go out of body without being close to death, like traumatic experiences and things like that, either physically or, or mentally, emotionally traumatic can in, inspire these or in, induce these kind of experiences where, yeah, you either go out of body and you're over your body looking down, like watching a conversation between, you know, like the doctor telling something to you or, and, mm. uh, and the same with near death experiences. People can have those kind of things when they're maybe like with mountain climbers falling down a mountain and they'll have like a life review or something, even though their body is still totally absolutely fine it's just they're aware on some level that there's a good chance they're about to die um right so yeah all this stuff is so as we said a few times so mysterious um so yeah in terms of animals back to back to animals and things like that I mean, hey, let's start with yeah terminal lucidity in animals and then maybe talk about a few other phenomena that 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 you've kind of researched in in the non-human animal population let's say mm -hmm. okay yeah yeah, well, so um, I published this paper with Rupert, we mentioned it already, mm -hmm. and it concerns also the 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 kind of a broader context of end of life or near death yeah. phenomena. So terminal lucidity in animals is only one sub category that the paper we was created. called sorry end of life experiences or end in, of life in... experiences. Yeah. Right. in non-human animals is that the paper it's called something like that and and it's the same for humans because we could have gone into this if we had more time like uh end of life experiences is kind of like the cat the, the broader yeah like you say category and under that there's there's terminal lucidity but then there's so many other things right there's like a a, a list that's essentially still not completed and may never be completed like there's always <laughs> little things that that people may mm. notice and and mm. loads of things that probably don't have a name yet mm. and stuff like that yeah 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 that's right. So, well, yeah, um, Rupert had the idea to um, to publish such a paper. And, of course, I assume you know Rupert. He's around for, for decades and publishing very interesting yeah. books and papers about also some parapsychological matters. Mm -hmm. And he has also been researching unusual behaviors of animals and pets for yeah. quite I guess some I should time show my book that i got there for, that, that rupert published this one right that's and a very famous that right and very now. interesting book and, yeah. and i should also say that rupert was one of the people who influenced me very early on so i i loved his books already in back in the 80s and 90s and and so i i was really uh glad and it was a great honor now to collaborate with him on such a topic yeah and because he's so well known, he has already, uh, people sent him reports on unusual occurrences um, regarding their pets throughout mm -hmm. the years. And then he also did some public appeals uh, and requests for, um, uh, he asked people to send reports to him concerning such unusual um, death related behaviors of animals. And so we had, and I have people, some people also reported such stories to me. So we had this database we could draw upon. And then we also noted that they differ to some extent, these experiences. And so we tried to uh, yeah, develop some kind of a system or some categories in which we could, could classify these reports according to certain elements that seem to be most prominent. And so we also, I think it was seven cases of the 114 that we considered for our publication that we mm, described as terminal lucidity. But it is, of course, very difficult to talk of, about terminal lucidity in animals because they don't talk. 
So yeah. you cannot really know what's re going on inside of the mind of a dog or a cat. You only have the outside perspective. Well, it's basically similar to to also non-responsive humans, if you like. But of course, it's still more difficult because mm -hmm. even if animals are weak or very ill, they can still mentally clear. And if they now become clear again, that would not be an incidence of terminal acidity because this obviously implies a confused, a demented or whatever state of consciousness before this episode. Yeah. But there were some in which these parallels seem to be very obvious, like one dog with a tumor, a uh, brain tumor, or I think there was, uh, you, I think a cat that was demented. Cats can become demented. And so they were without orientation and or in a comatose state. There was one bird, I think. Yeah, the bird crashed against a window mm. and then the person got out and took the bird and the bird was apparently non-conscious, eyes closed, but still the heart was beating, didn't move. Probably the neck was broken, don't know. And then this bird suddenly opened its eyes turned its head towards this person and then died. So it's a very short episode, of course, and also yeah. a short state of unconsciousness or assumed unconsciousness. But still, it's a kind of a terminal acidity in this in, in terms of this bird being unconscious, non-responsive, mm -hmm. and then suddenly opening its eyes and connecting with this person who holds the bird in, in the hand. So these are some examples that we um, classified as terminal lucidity. And we yeah. even found some cases in which the pet owners described some events uh, shortly before the uh, death of their animals in, in terms of a near-death vision, or they seemed mm -hmm. to... Yeah. They had the... the, the, had the impression that this this animal saw something mm -hmm. like there was this one dog who was in a non-responsive almost comatose state who suddenly sat up on on his uh, legs and or stood up and seemed to radiate with a certain happiness and even wagged its tail and then uh, followed something through the room with its with yeah. his head and its eyes that was uh, but not visible uh, for the the humans uh, who were present. And then the dog just collapsed again into this comatose, unresponsive state and, and died a few hours later. Yeah. So, and, and we found this very impressive that many of these end-of-life experiences were so similar to yeah. those reported from dying humans. Some of them, just to quickly jump in and say something, I think if I remember rightly, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there were also one or two cases of like um, a dog or cat, for example, like the, the has been on a very bad way or in a very bad way, like kind of basically comatose or, or not eating and clearly on their last, you know, hours or days. And the owner has made an appointment with the vet to have the dog or cat put down um, and um and then like the day before the appointment, the dog will have this, yeah, like hour or two hours or they'll wake up in the morning and they'll be eating like normal. They'll be all energetic mm -hmm. and playful again, like a puppy. And they'll all be, you know, everything's great. The dog's jumping up on the bed, something they haven't done yeah. for three months or something. And so the, the person will ring the vet and say, actually, no, can we cancel tomorrow? Because, you know, suddenly the dog is is better. Mm -hmm. And then the next day, yeah, back to back to or, or within a couple of hours, maybe the next day back to comatose and then unfortunately dead but yeah like to the extent that people will cancel these appointments that's like clearly a really strong example of terminal lucidity um so i hope i'm right mm. in remembering a case like that you are certainly right in remembering the case but i'm not so sure if this is a case of terminal lucidity because yeah. i think in these cases we don't know or it wasn't specified if the animal had been in a confused yeah. comatose or demented state before so what yeah. you've described and i think this is also how we call it is simply the last rally right it's, yes it's yeah. very similar of course to terminal yeah CDG, very similar. but it chiefly yeah. concerns a renewed bodily energy and we find right. this in human beings as well but mm -hmm. it uh, and it can go hand in hand with terminal acidity 
but it yeah. can also happen in people who die with a bright mind and who have mm -hmm. never been in a confused or demented state. So I think it's also, again, something we can differentiate. There is mm -hmm. a mental level to end of life phenomena and a bodily level or somatic level. Like the last rally is, uh, it can occur in a combination or uh, along with terminal lucidity, but both can occur uh, on their own. So you can find yeah. the last rally in the sense of a very amazing bodily energy and strength in dying humans, dying animals, but it's not necessarily related to a particular state of mind before this occurrence. And you can even have, or well, also have terminal lucidity, as I, I've, I mentioned it earlier, when people just maybe open their eyes and seem to connect to the mm -hmm. people around them with their eyes. So without any bodily vigor or renewed energy and so so there are the, all these different facets of end of life phenomena that can or cannot occur together and so on mm. yeah are there any other kind of death related or, or you know psychic phenomena that from in animals non-human animals that you wanted to discuss do you want to talk about any of the other research that you've done in these areas well Concerning animal LEEs, there is one, I think we called it last visits, and mm -hmm. I might yeah. comment briefly on that. Yeah. So last visits, so or we had two very similar categories, last goodbyes and last visits. In last goodbyes, animals, also very weak animals, seem to say goodbye to their loved ones, maybe get up from their mat, from their basket, go to the owner's seem to say goodbye, go back to the basket and die. So the, it's a very um, archetypal case. And the last visit is very similar, but in these cases, we put um, cases that involve traveling larger distances. So they are not occurring inside one the home of the owner and the pet, but the pets really crossed at times considerable distances from one house to an ex to another yeah. for example to say goodbye to a previous owner um which with, with whom they were not living anymore maybe even for years and so there was one particularly interesting case in which the dog was given to a friend mm -hmm. who already um, spent much time with the dog and then there were some complications and the family had to move away with well, the dog owner's family and so they decided to let the dog stay with this friend mm -hmm. where it lived for the rest of um, its life and then one day the former owner who hadn't seen this dog for years and the dog also had never been to this new home of its uh, former yeah. owner. Yeah. There was a scratching at the window or at the door. And then they saw, hey, that's that's the old dog, you know, who was apparently coming to visit them at night or the afternoon. And so there was, of course, a great hello. And so, oh, what are you doing here? <laughs> And so it was very old, the dog with the white hair around the snout already. And then it stayed the night. And in the morning, it uh, indicated that it wanted to go back. And so they let the dog go again. And a few days later, or sometime later, they, uh, they had an exchange with this uh, new dog owner who then at the years before took that dog and he said, oh yeah, there was this very strange episode where my dog or our, the dog went away, suddenly stayed overnight, returned the next morning and then died a few days, I think two days later. So it seems that the dog went to this former owner to say goodbye for a last visit and then so we have more examples of this, but in this case, it's specifically amazing because the dog didn't yeah. even know where the new owner was living. It had never yeah. been there before, and it was several miles away and across a river, and he had to cross a bridge. And, and these are amazing stories, and they have been um, reported before, especially uh, by uh, Sally Ryan Feather and 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 I think 
Louisa Ryan, whatever, and Rupert collected some reports of these type of experiences where cats or dogs, for whatever reason, not necessarily shortly before dying, found the location of beloved owners, mm -hmm. even at places where they had never been to before, and even across really great uh, distances. Yeah. 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 That's such an extraordinary case because like, mm. especially because they didn't know. Yeah. He didn't know the dog didn't know where the, the previous owners lived. And <clears throat> and you're right. The distance kind of mostly rules out normal senses. Mm. And in, in Rupert's book, uh, Dogs That Know When Their Owners Are Coming Home and Other Unexplained Powers of Animals, like obviously it talks about dogs that know when their owners are coming home. But there's also like cases of, yeah, like animals like uh, reacting to the distant death of loved ones or animals, even potentially saving the life of, of somebody, which is mm -hmm. really fascinating. There was one that I think I just read the other day of a dog that some friends of this lady were looking after the dog and this this late you know like miles away i think maybe 50 miles or more something along those like maybe an hour's drive something like that and mm -hmm. um this dog suddenly went to the end of the garden and started howling in the in the this direction and and firstly they're like oh, what's going on with the dog you know like just bring her inside or something give her a treat i don't know let's give her a little little back rub and mm -hmm. this dog obviously didn't settle and continued to howl in this direction and the friends thankfully thought oh, there must be something wrong with with whoever the owner is i can't you know the name uh, emily let's say whatever mm -hmm. um and so then they they try to call no answer they drive to the house and she'd overdosed intentionally like trying to you know end her life and they they managed to to save her life because mm -hmm. of the dog and and again like the distance there like there's no way this dog is doing anything with normal senses mm -hmm. um so fascinating and uh and yeah these cases that you guys are looking into now are, are totally fascinating are you going to be working on the rest of the papers um with like jim matlock and uh, or are you are you kind of are you going to stay involved with them as the, the the series of papers continues on these end of life phenomena death related phenomena yeah for the next paper definitely so i i know jim for quite some years and we have some yeah. projects together and so there's one paper that we it's actually largely finished scheduled yeah. to be published sometime soon in this year it's about um Other near, I think, uh, uh, animal after death contacts. Yeah, like yes. communications. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, I'm in with Jim on that paper, and yeah. I think Rupert as well. And then Jim moves on to discussing reincarnation cases that might be occurring in animals. So I'm aware of it, and. Yeah. I provide him with literature and so but i'm i'm so far not not uh, really actively participating in writing this type of paper but cool. jim is doing yeah. a great great work here and yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm in good contact with him i'm glad to hear it because yeah jim's jim's awesome like i spoke to jim uh for this show a couple of times and mm. we went into detail on the animals and yeah he's a really great guy and doing like yourself fascinating research let me ask you as a biologist and everything and with these this fascinating kind of array of of experiences and and knowledge how do you think the experience of non-human animals differs from that of our own experience and i know that we need to have a certain amount of speculation to do a you know answer a question like this so i'm not you know necessarily looking for a definitive answer mm -hmm. of course but yeah what is your kind of take on on that like how does the experience differ do you think it's potentially the same consciousness coming through a different filter aka a different you know brain um how do you yeah how do you try to talk through that I have no clear opinion uh, about this. It's of course yeah. difficult. So I do think that animals are conscious to some degree. Of course, it depends on what type of animal you're talking about. But I think the higher animals like birds, cats, dogs, whatever, other mammals, they are certainly conscious to some extent, even though they cannot think logically. <laughs> Um, and I also think that they do have some type of, um, you know, self-consciousness or self-awareness. They, they, they perceive themselves as an I, as, as a person. Mm -hmm. That's what I think. I mean, there are, of course, many uh, biologists uh, who would uh, maybe disagree and say, no, no, no. But I think that's what happens. And I also think that animals have a much more developed sense of 
approaching death than is often assumed. Mm. Like people often tend to think, well, if they have only a very uh, minimal consciousness, they can't be um, able to form an appropriate notion about what it means to die. Just like small children, you know, ch mm. small children cannot know what uh, what it means to die. And this is also something that we seemed to find in our very preliminary study on terminal lucidity in little children. They do seem to have a concept about dying yeah. and about going home or however they, they phrase it and so on. Yeah. And uh, yeah, so I, I do think that also animals have these ideas. I don't know to, to which degree they are really conscious about it, but they know when their end is close or some of them do know, I'm for sure. I'm, I'm sure about that. And maybe they even perceive also other things very, very similarly than we do. And we also know there's lots of research on these matters. You know, the, the brain physiology of animals, when humans are happy, there are certain hormones that the brain releases. When humans are bad and depressed, then there are also some certain substances that uh, the brain releases. And we know that the brains of higher animals or mammals, they emit the same hormones, the same biomolecules in similar situations where we might think, ah, now the animal seems to be happy. Now it seems to be sad. So I, I think there's no reason to doubt that they have also an inner experience that is similar to our own experience. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think if we like, I do you, I don't know if you subscribe to the theory of, you know, like the idea that, or the idea that consciousness is like kind of, you know, non-local and our brain is like a, an antenna, mm -hmm. um, that kind of, that kind of idea. And I think if that's, if that is what turns out that is going on, if that's accurate and, and after death, we kind of gain this, you know, this abundance of knowledge, we kind of, we're on a different level of consciousness after death because we're not constrained to our physical bodies, let's say. And mm -hmm. that's why, you know, when people in near-death experiences, they come back and they report that they felt like they knew everything. They mm -hmm. felt like, you know, that they, they had all this great awareness and, and all of this kind of thing. It seems kind of logical to me to think that, okay, so if we have that ultimate awareness and ultimate consciousness when we don't have a body and then in the human form, we have this level of intellect and, and awareness and consciousness that we are, at, that, that we talk about and that we have, then maybe you see in dogs or or other animals primates whatever that they have a, a level that's comparable but maybe not the same and then as you kind of go down like you have less and less maybe it could all just be in the brain maybe it could all just be yeah different different equipment different um antenna whatever different way of of trans transmitting that same thing so maybe mm. it's still the same consciousness on the un ultimate level mm. it's just um having this different experience on this different yeah through this different as i say kind of equipment uh this different computer uh whatever however we want to phrase it different mm. tv uh different yeah internet wi-fi <laughs> um mm. how far down do you think consciousness goes uh, and what are your thoughts in in regards to consciousness when it comes to trees and plants speculation speculation yeah, yeah. I mean, we're near it's... the end of the interview this is speculation <laughs> time now <laughs> <laughs> well I, I think if we look at ourselves there are levels that we call unconscious or subconscious and they determine what we do that they co-determine what we do even though we don't really know it but still we think there is we, we, we call it some form of consciousness even though mm -hmm. it's not conscious so it's it's basically also a matter of how exactly we define consciousness and like this this type of self-aware consciousness that i perceive myself as a conscious individual i think this is probably not very widespread among trees <laughs> <laughs> or, or amoebas or maybe lower forms of uh, life but there might be some general sense of purpose mm -hmm. i mean that's what animals and also trees and, and plants fungi uh, display in their course of life they they act purposefully or they, or they grow purposefully they they yeah they process stimuli purposefully 
And they also seem to have purposeful way to propagate themselves. So there might be a very rudimentary sense of awareness that still cannot be compared to what we typically experience as consciousness. But I don't know. I mean, there, there, there are so many open questions regarding consciousness. Just think of persons with dissociative identity disorder mm. and the yeah. different altars that they all have inside the, this one personality. And yeah. they have different access to different memories, depending on what de what uh, level of hierarchy they are yeah. situated. So you different tastes so you, and yeah. other stuff. So yeah. so some authors may kind of observe everything that's going on, even when the other authors are at the front. And mm -hmm. so they have memories of what these authors do, but other authors don't have memories about the times that happened when other authors again had been on the front. So maybe there are all kinds of different consciousness, even though we are not aware of it mm -hmm. or cannot communicate with it. Maybe we even have aspects of our own body that are somehow conscious, but they are... Um, on a different level and cannot yeah. be connected to our conscious consciousness. So we just don't know. But but I think com com uh, consciousness is an extremely complex matter. Yeah. And as I said, I'm not sure if we will ever fully understand it when we try to approach it with a scientific and logical method. And yeah. as you said, maybe we should really focus more on mystical experiences and near-death experiences which kind of are kind of a mystical experience very often yeah. and take into account what those people say that have experienced these aspects of consciousness mm -hmm. and they all say hey yeah. i don't have words for that word and language don't suffice to describe what what i experienced and you cannot approach it and understand with logic and time and space and causation and it's something really really <laughs> very different mm -hmm. and i think yeah. the, the the idea that uh, living beings are kind of a representation of something consciousness related and have these you know some kind call it a filter or a channel to bring out certain aspects of consciousness that seems to be reasonable Although I would say it's it's maybe more than kind of the filter metaphor is also of the kind of a passive thing, but I think the brain and organisms are also much more active. So we actually seem to create a world for ourselves, for our species that mm -hmm. enables conscious experience of uh, things that would or experiences that would not be possible for consciousness on its own. You know, maybe consciousness has to have physical matter, time and space, and a very, very complicated brain and sensory organs, because it, it for some reason, intends to experience itself in all these different manners. And yeah. so, like all the other animals, like apes, cats, snails, maybe even fungi, maybe they have a very, very specific type of consciousness that is manifested through these processes and that also creates a specific environment that they live in, that they perceive and act in, because this is one way that consciousness as a whole wants or needs or whatever, whatever reason to experience itself. So this is a very old notion. It's also something that was in a very widespread um, notion in German Romanticism again. And I think that's an overall very fruitful path to think along these ways. Yeah. Yeah. It's really fascinating uh, thinking. I really, really like fascinating stuff that you're saying. I'm, I do definitely think that the more we learn about consciousness, the more questions we have. Right. I think it mm -hmm. always seems to be that way in these areas, particularly like the, the more I learn, the more I feel like I don't know, you know, the more the more we understand, the less we understand in a way. It's always going to be just ahead of us. So even if we increase our knowledge, like consciousness is always going to be kind of rising with us. Um, and there's always going to be these new questions and mysteries and things that we observe. Mm -hmm. um, 
So yeah, to to kind of finish us up here, Michael, if you could um, share maybe any anomalous experiences or go into one anomalous experience that maybe you've had along the lines of the kind of phenomena that we've been discussing today. Yeah, well, one experience that I found very remarkable and that I still remember very vividly today was an out-of-body experience I had some 30 years ago. And I was... um, sleeping, lying in my bed at that time and waking up. And I was lying in my room and there was this strange atmosphere. It was kind of a, it felt a little bit like an electrical ch- charge in that room. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and all of a sudden I, I noticed that I was able to lift my body from the bed. And so I, I, I did that and then floated out of the window through the glass and had a very amazing flight around the roofs of the surrounding houses at the town I was living at that time. And I even made it above the hospital uh, roof. And so I flew back and I was totally uh, amazed and freaked out because at that time I didn't really know much about these issues and didn't know what an out of body experience was and, and so on. So I was, for some reason, convinced I was able to fly with my physical body. So I oh, also, wow. when, when I lifted, when I left my bed, I didn't look back. So I also, I didn't see my body lying in there or something. So I just got up from the bed and started to fly. And it was really, really amazing. And it was extremely realistic. And so at one point, I flew back into my room and I said, oh, this was amazing. And I said, let's give it another try. So I started to fly a second time uh, above all these roofs of um, the surrounding houses. And I, I, I checked all the, you know, the chimneys and the antenna and, and their locations. And so and, and then I, I flew back into my room and then ended up on my bed and then to my bed click. And I was again, or still in my body, but it felt different again. And I was very, very disappointed to find that I was not able to fly anymore. And and I was really totally excited. And so I wasn't able to sleep again. And it was still, I don't know, three or four in the morning. So I I lay in my bed and waited until the sun went up and and the the morning uh, came. And so I we had so I was living on, on the fourth floor of a building and above that there was was a flat flat roof so yeah. and we could or we spent always time on that roof in summer or beautiful weather we could go there and drink some stuff eat something so as the first light came on i went up to that roof and i checked if all that i memorized regarding the chimneys and the antenna and the roofs how they looked uh, was okay and and it was so i found this really really strange and impressive and yeah that's that's basically what what i want want to share here and but again it's 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 not something that can be considered evidential from a scientific or a a parapsychological point of view because Mm -hmm. as i said i've spent some time on this roof every now and then anyway so uh, yeah during daylight so one might argue that because i've been there so often i have unconsciously memorized all the surrounding roofs, chimneys, antenna in in my yeah. mind, and then just reproduced it in kind of this um, hallucinatory out-of-body experience. That's, a, mm. in this case, a valid argument because uh, in contrast to some of the reports that we know from the literature on NDEs, I didn't perceive something that I, I could say, I, I really didn't know that this was there and that it was there, like, like a shoe or whatever. So I only yeah. saw things that seemed to be familiar, but it nevertheless was really one of the most memorable and strange and also, um, what's the word, euphorization, Euph- euphoric. euphoric. Yeah, yeah I, yeah, I really, I really was eu- euphoric when yeah. I flew around <laughs> in this, wow. if, in, in, at night, you know, and in, in the, in the street lamps and, and the roofs, and it was a really, really fantastic experience, yeah. Yeah, that sounds incredible. I wish I, I wish I could have the same experience. That sounds <laughs> yeah. so cool. Well, How many I times experimented you have a lot experience? with the different different states of awareness, and I had some 
sometimes a little bit something like OBEs again. I experimented very much with lucid dreaming and so on, but but mm. none of this ever reached the same quality of this experience. Fascinating, yeah. Mm. I would love to have known, like, obviously, if you could go back and, like, you know, have the experience again, I'd love to know if you, like, went and saw somebody, tried to go into somebody's room and, you know, would they have sensed your presence or would mm. they have seen something or, you know, it's so fascinating. And, like, yeah, you could have gone and tried to look for some kind of, yeah, evidential information. That, mm. But, yeah, wow, so, so cool. And thank you so much for sharing it. Michael, this has been awesome. I've, I've really loved this conversation. It's been really fascinating. We've talked about so many incredible uh, mind-bending phenomena um i really look forward to doing it again but yeah thank you again for your time and and for for talking with me i really appreciate it yeah, thanks again for the invitation and thankful thank you for your time thank you to michael nan for talking with me thank you to our patrons for helping to keep our show alive and thank you for listening i hope you gain some new insights and are looking forward to my round two with michael see the description for relevant links click subscribe to continue unraveling the universe with us and if you want to help us keep making content, please consider a monthly contribution via Patreon. Thank you.